It's interesting that Paul should write about wisdom here and not in the most encouraging of ways in a certain sense because Paul was a man who was very wise. He was very learned in his day. He probably was very familiar with the classical Greek philosophies that had predated him. And he spent most of his time as a religious leader, an educator, and appears to have been something of an enforcer in his religious tradition as well, until he encountered Christ and everything started to change and he had to reassess the value of things that he'd known up until that time. But Paul really knew a lot about wisdom. And it's interesting to note that the, the basic idea of wisdom, particularly as it's contained in the Hebrew Testaments, is the idea of being able to do something well, having the skills to do something well. So, for example, if you read the uh, early passages in the Pentateuch about the temple or the sacrificial system, you'll hear that the people that made Aaron's garments for the temple were wise in making garments. So they knew how to do it. They understood the technology. They understood how to achieve what they wanted to achieve. Similarly, those who worked with gold and silver were wise with working with gold and silver. It's the same idea. They knew how to do it. They knew how to make it come together in a way that would work for the outcome that they intended. And so it seems like our modern day concept of wisdom has evolved a little bit so that now it, people who are wise are those who have worked out how life works or how the world works. They're wise about how the whole thing comes together and they, they demonstrate that in their words and in their lifestyle kind of thing. The modern day version of wisdom is a more generalised sense of navigating life effectively, I think. An understanding of life and how things work. Um, those people who can do that are considered wise. Uh, many years ago, little cars started appearing around the streets with um, a, a not very well-known name, Google, and uh, funny things on the roof, and they were taking photographs of the street. And I don't know about you, but when I first saw them appear, it was quite a long time ago, I thought, what on earth is that? And uh, they had GPS things and all kind of stuff going on. And uh, I found out that they were trying to take photos of every street on the planet. And this is in a day when I was using a Nokia phone that still had that little snake game on it. And I thought, why? Why, why would you want photos of every street on the planet? they could see something that most people could not see. And that is that one day we would have the internet in our pockets and people would choose the most straightforward way of doing something. And that meant if they could see a picture of where they were going on a map and so forth, they'd choose it. They were really wise about understanding how things would work. I think there's an extraordinary sense of foresight in all of that. Um, they could see something that uh, in the future nearly everybody would want a service like this and everybody would be using it and uh, people wouldn't have to pay for the service but people would gladly pay for the people who were using the service, pay for access to them, advertising and so forth. Google had the wisdom of the way things work at that point. Keep moving my slide. That's that slide. See, and once you've worked out how things work in the world, you can make them work well for you. And we see this all around. People who have worked out how to make the prevailing currents of life work well for themselves, and they find them, themselves moving up the stratas of society. And we also see foolish people who haven't worked that out, and they find themselves down the bottom and not doing so well sometimes. Uh, they're not very good at making things work well for themselves. It could be a choice or it could be that they just haven't learnt how the thing works. And you think about the Google strategy, it looks like a strategy for serving people with information, doesn't it? That Google serves up information, of course they do. Or is it something else that's going on there? 
have they actually been really smart about serving themselves because they knew that if they got enough information together it would be a valuable resource and if they cornered the market they would do very well for themselves. Is Google about serving up information or is Google about serving its investors? And then you get this, how do you make things work well for you and what does that even mean? You see, wisdom depends on what target you're trying to hit. The value of a wisdom depends on where it takes you, in a sense. It sounds like Paul's not so interested in wisdom in this passage. He's saying that God has shown up the wisdom of the world to not be so wise because he's done something that's outside of that structure in bringing salvation. No doubt he's reflecting on his own life as he says this, I would think. He was learned in the sacred texts. He would have been well taught in all the traditions of his time and his culture and his religion. He was a leader and, as I say, a bit of an enforcer uh, in his community. But none of this led Paul to God. In fact, in his experience, it led him to be in opposition to God. The very place he thought he was going, he found out he was going the opposite direction, based on the wisdom that he had learnt and become formed by. It's as though the wisdom of the, of the world that he knew was aiming at a completely different target. The better he did all the things in his tradition, the further away he went from where he wanted to be. Writing to the Philippians, Paul would say that he counts all these things as loss compared to the surpassing greatness of Christ. And it's interesting, he says, he doesn't say, I count them all but neutral or irrelevant. He says they are loss. They took me away. They blocked my path. They obfuscated the reality. They made me pursue an alternate direction. They weren't that useful to me. In fact, they were worse than not useful. They were unhelpful. And so we think about the shape and direction of our lives. Where do you want your life to end up? Do you ever think about that? What do you want your life to amount to? What contribution will your life make? How would a life with no regrets look for you? Just if you could imagine a life with no regrets. What would that look like for you? What is it that you value the most of all the things you know in life? And there's a sneaky challenge here for us because you've got to beware of the stories we tell ourselves. We need to tell ourselves stories about who we are because we need to be able to live with ourselves and so we tend to fudge the details that don't fit within the things we think are important and we just overlook certain things and focus on certain other things and tell a story about ourselves that um, makes us feel a bit better. So, for example, I can tell the story that I'm concerned about the environment, but if I drink loads of takeaway coffee out of those little cups that are plastic lined, how much am I caring for the environment? Or do I just overlook that bit? Or I could tell you that I care about the welfare of animals, but if I pay no attention about how my eggs are farmed and I really don't care what they do to treat the animals that produce the food that I might eat, how much do I really care? And I might even say I believe in social justice, but if I sense the stability of our society appears to be premised on the exclusion of some so that the majority can live more comfortably, well, I just wonder what parts do we become selectively focused on? When it com comes to discerning what we actually value, as I've said here, Many times you're probably bored of it now, but I really think our actions are more eloquent and more uh, honest than the stories that we tell ourselves. And so, in a sense, this is where the profound wisdom of Christ comes in. Because there's a wisdom that is wiser than wisdom, and it is 
contained in the story of the gospel. And forgiveness is perhaps the most fundamental part of that story. Forgiveness, I think, is the wisdom of God because forgiveness offers release from the way we have done things in the past. That doesn't mean we forget about them or neglect them or don't care about them, but we are not necessarily held by them in the same way. It's extraordinary how our past and our culture hold us. We are heavily invested in the stories and the meaning that have formed us. We don't even know they're there half the time, and so we can't critique them. They make our life meaningful. They make sense to us. And forgiveness offers us release from that and allows us the opportunity to reinterpret, to think again about the meaning of things. It gives us a capacity even to reinterpret our past. We might look back on our past experiences and have regrets or think that was a dumb decision or all these sorts of things might be there and they kind of haunt us. But forgiveness allows us to go back and go, I can see how that led to that and that and that. And if here is a place where I'm in a good place, all those things can become reinterpreted in a sense that gives us a sense of God's hand at work. It's an extraordinary thing. We can see ourselves in a new way and open a a truly hopeful future because forgiveness is the grace that allows us to see ourselves more clearly than ever before. Forgiveness is the safest place to encounter truth. Forgiveness holds us so safely that we can see past our self-protecting strategies and acknowledge a bigger and more meaningful story. Forgiveness is the grace to let go of an incomplete understanding and the permission to pursue a deeper truth. See, outside the context of forgiveness, it's so dangerous for our psyche to look at honestly at ourselves. We simply won't allow ourselves to do it, I don't think. Our most primal instincts block us from seeing truth that threatens our sense of well-being. And so forgiveness provides the safety that is required for the most profound honesty. That's wisdom in my book. And if you start to see things that you decide aren't helpful, you've got the opportunity to let go of them and turn around the way you're doing life and to shift your deepest values. Too often in the religious environment, when people are so-called converted, they might change their tribal allegiance and uh, keep going on living much like they did before. Uh, That is to say, our deepest held values don't necessarily shift. More social stuff might shift, superficial stuff. We might call ourselves a, a one of those or a one of these. I'm a born again or I'm a, a, what, a uniting, I'm a mustard seed, I'm a Christian, I'm a whatever it might be. Reformed, fundamental, no, anyway. But even calling yourself something different doesn't necessarily change very much. We might start attending religious activities like church or Bible study and I want to encourage that so don't get me wrong. But that doesn't necessarily shift our deepest values. And we might even shift our friendship group and start making new friends, which is always good to do, make new friends. But if our deepest held values about the way we behave towards other people don't shift, then I wonder about that. How we spend our time and money and our thought life and energy and that kind of thing. If these things carry on much in the pre-conversion trajectory, I I wonder what that means. Because there is a deeper, fuller, richer life. And it means, means going the right direction, which is that direction. It means being not quite like everybody else, I think. And in the world's mind, that's folly. It's foolish. It doesn't work. It won't get you up the social ladder. See, to me, the clearest indicator of having received eternal life is the shift of the deepest held values toward that which is eternally valuable. 
Last week I mentioned the time frame of values, remember, with how you can have short term investments and longer term investments, and we thought a little bit about a lifetime investment, you know, education for your children, raising them healthily and all that kind of stuff, and then an eternal timeline of value and what that might look like. If everything we value only really has value on the temporal timeline, to what extent do we really, have we really entered eternal life? I think that question begs as well. What does a life look like that genuinely values that which is eternal? We spoke last week about love, and I think that's absolutely critical. A life that is shaped and motivated by love. And this can be expressed in the way that we engage with people, and uh, it reflects their eternal value. So we're valuing people and their eternal value, that kind of thing. When we genuinely care about strangers, The fact that they're strangers doesn't mean they're less valuable or show concern for those who are struggling, not as detached outsiders or superiors, but as people who understand that people have eternal value. And in fact, the good of all of us is tied up with the good of each of us. And my well-being is tied up with your well-being and so forth. We only love any person to the extent that we love our enemies. I mean, that's, that's the kind of radical stuff that Jesus said, although he said it slightly differently, but that was the gist of it. Now, I see lots of people at Mustard Seed doing that in all sorts of quiet and unassuming ways because it is quiet and it is unassuming and it's faithfulness. It's holding those values and doing service and caring for people because that's good to do. It's not trumpeting it. There's no newspaper headlines or media, social media frenzy over it. It's just that gentle, day by day, care for one another and looking out for those, not just in our own circle, but on the fringe of our circle and beyond our circle. And I'm really encouraged by that. And I've got to tell you, uh, I hope Way won't mind me saying this, but she said as we were walking down to the powerhouse, or walking back from the powerhouse last week, I'm really enjoying the people at church. They're so lovely. I don't think you can ask for better. So wisdom, it takes you places. What's the wisdom that you're following? Because the wisdom of Christ upends the wisdom of the world and people will say following Christ is foolish but this foolishness will take you to the eternal life, the richest fullest, deepest eternal life. The new life offered in Christ is foolishness for those who have no value for it. Their focus is on the shorter term and the closer field of value and interest. But for those who perceive true value, eternal value, that which has been disregarded as foolish by the wise of this world is in fact the richest place we can be. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for your grace. You're not put off by the wisdom, so-called, of this world. But your love for us, in your love for us, you came and lived a life that many would consider to be foolish and showed us the way to eternal life. Help us to see that, to keep looking at it and to allow your gracious forgiveness to enable us to be ever more honest about the reality of where we are Not so that we will be condemned, because there is no more condemnation, but so that we might be set free to pursue that which is truly worth pursuing, truly worthy of the lives that you've created and called us into, to the glory of your holy name. Amen.